and grandchildren. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to present to you Ambassador Swanee Hunt. I'm delighted to be here. This conference is uh, very exciting, and when my colleague uh, Dana Boring at the Kennedy School heard that I was going to be here, she got all excited and, um, and told me all about this meeting. And a, a lot of people have pitched in to make this happen, and I, uh, I appreciate the cadets who have been my, uh, my uh, escorts, and, and I appreciate you all for being here. I assume there's a reason, some kind of curiosity you have in, in what I'm going to say, and um, I hope I will serve it up to you in a way that you can take it in. Um, oh, wait, where's my clicker? Is this it? Good. All right. This is going to be uh, a setting in which you all have a lot of experience, so much more than the rest of the population, and I'm going to take you on a, something of a whirlwind in the next few minutes as we go. We're going to be moving through uh, Afghanistan, the Balkans, uh, Iraq, and Washington, D.C., and uh, just follow me, all right? And I, I chose those places. I could have talked about really anywhere in the world these same principles apply, but I, I thought that those were places that would have a particular resonance with you. And as you, um, as you did say, when people say to me all over the world, where are you from, I always say Colorado. I sure don't say Dallas, Texas. I consider myself from Dallas, <laughs> but in Colorado. Even though I was here 16 years, I still have a place in South Park, a ranch there, hence the bison. But you know, I've lived 20 years in Vienna and 20 years, no, four years in Vienna and 20 years uh, up in Cambridge at Harvard where I tried to, I, I had imposter syndrome like most people do at Harvard, and then uh, moved down to Washington because my work, so much of it is in public policy now. Um, my goal has been to take women from the sense of the, the slot that we have them in as victims and needing to be helped and to be brought along and to be empowered, et cetera, and to be recognized for who we are, which is we actually are experts. And uh, we have an awful lot to say, and we have particular ways of seeing the world, and we are so glad, guys, that you are here to learn from us. So that's supposed to bring a smile, but I mean, it sounds to me like you're taking that very seriously, which is also fine. Um, you mentioned the book on Rwanda, I'll tell you, uh, I've worked from Korea to Congo, and it, 17 years I worked on that book. I uh, am a slow learner. It was not meant to be a longitudinal study, but it turned into that because I wanted to figure out how they did it, how those women came to be 64% of the parliament, how they came to be half the president's cabinet and half the Supreme Court, and then what difference it made. So if you're curious, I have been hearing for years about how, oh, you know, what country in the world has the highest percentage of women in parliament? And there would always be someone, you know, of course, Norway, of course, Sweden, et cetera. Someone stupid would say, you know, the United States, no. <laughs> there are 102 countries ahead of us. I will repeat that, 102 countries ahead of us. But always there would be someone out there who would say, I think it's Rwanda, and that person got extra points, because in fact, that's true. So I would work on getting all of these women up on the stage and speaking at the forum, et cetera, uh, at, at Harvard, where we had 40 heads of state one year, and then I would bring these 12 women on the stage, and the dean would introduce them. So people often think of me as working on whatever, uh, the, the women stuff. But actually, my play has been someplace else that put, people wouldn't guess. And it's with the policymakers. Because if you think about, there are all these competent women, but who gets chosen to be at the High Council for the negotiations with the Taliban? No, it's 
all men. If you look around, I actually went to uh, the UN and I said, how come there are no women on all these negotiating teams in Africa? And the guy at the UN said, uh, well, Ambassador Hunt, the warlords won't have women. And I said, well, why not? And he said, because they're afraid the women would compromise. Bingo. Like, isn't that the point? Isn't that the point of the negotiation? So I'm really, really interested in how you convince the policymakers to elevate women in their thinking. It's a different kind of way of seeing it. So I was in Baghdad, where Paul Bremer was essentially the proconsul, right? Uh, after shock and awe. And uh, it was so interesting talking with him. I said, you know, you've got this governing council that we are completely responsible for, 100%, 24 people on it, three women sitting there with 21 men. Now, I know that here you know, in the armed services, there is, this is not a new idea. And there have to be those breakthrough women who are, who are the very first ones. But it's hard. It's really hard to be one of, you know, one of the group, two is a lot better, three is magic, right? With three, you can really have an echo chamber. But still, we were completely in charge and we only had uh, three out of the 24. Why does it matter? Well, I talked to uh, Bremer and, uh, and I said, you know, you've got to have women. And he said, well, we're not going to have quotas. And I said, okay. Uh, I get it, Americans are allergic to quotas, right? Actually, actually, isn't it? Don't we have something like there are going to be two senators no matter what from every state? What do you call that, right? Oh, and there's going to be one House member every time you have a district with a certain, a certain population. What do you call that? So I said, hey, so how did you choose this council? Did you take a bunch of names and did you drop them in a hat and then everyone closed their eyes and, and drew names? No. You said, okay, we gotta do this right. We gotta have a certain number of Shia, we've gotta have a certain number of Sunni, and we've got to make sure that we had have, have a strong representation of Kurds. How is that different from saying, and we've got to make sure that this council looks like the population? That it's, it's so unfamiliar to us to talk about, you know, that, that just sounds awful to have this gender quota to us. But open up your thinking because, in fact, we, we do it a lot. And so you say, well, um, why, is, why is this so important? And, um, you know, it, it, is it really, do, do we really need to help these women along? I get that. And what I can tell you is that it makes a big, big difference, a very big difference, if your group has a significant number of women in it. The tone changes, the, uh, the knowledge base changes, the style. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But my second foray that I, when I saw, when I went to Iraq, I was really building on this other experience right after the end of the bombing in Baghdad. I went to the Pentagon, and I met with a, a, one of these lovely generals, and I mean it. You know, most of the three and four stars, they are so, uh, they're really practiced at being kind. You know, I, they may have another side, I wouldn't know. But, but they, they're just so genteel, and so is and Madam Ambassador, thank you so much for taking the time. Here, won't you have some coffee? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And on about the fourth cup of coffee, I had made my point, I think. I had said, you have to bring the women leaders in now, and I'll tell you why. Because they are seen as less threatening, they can cross lines, and they're really used to working across the aisle. They have this, they have credibility as the maternal, um, uh, standing that they have. I'll tell you, for your own operational success, you need to bring in the women now. And he was 
he was so, he was nodding his head. I, I really appreciate your coming. And Madam Ambassador, I want to assure you. And he looked at me so sincerely, no question about how sincere he was. Madam Ambassador, I want to assure you that as soon as we can get the place secure, we'll be able to turn to women's issues. If I could, I would throw this. I would throw it in the, up in the air, but then Terry wouldn't give me another one, uh, ever. <laughs> because, you're, I mean, like, really? 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 I wasn't talking about cervical cancer. I was talking about security. And this was a good guy. I, don't, I really don't mean to take away from him. But you all, when we think of women's issues, I, I, I bet you're not much different from me. I mean, I think about issues on the margins, because that's where women are. Women are on the margins. And I'm not making this up. I mean, you can, you can think of all the different boards of directors you know, and all the high level, you know, the Fortune 500. I mean, they're a tiny, tiny number of women, like three who are the top executives in the Fortune 500. So um, every time, and here's what I'm asking you to do, in this, in this short time, when you hear yourself in your head saying something about, huh, this is really important, these women's issues, stop. Just stop the voice in your head, because that's not what we're talking about. We are talking about security. And in fact, we're talking about a certain notion of security, which is inclusive security. I'm going to say a word about three big ideas related to that. And the first one is take your cues from the people who are affected by your leadership. That's where the knowledge is. That's where the expertise is. And if you can connect to the people who are affected, you are going to have a much stronger policy and practice in your leadership. Second one, lead in tandem with unlikely partners. I'll say more about why and what that means and give you an example of that. Go for the unlikely ones. That's how you build your strongest base. And then be willing to bluff. I, I, how many of you are willing to bluff? Oh, lots of liars in this room. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about the first one, about taking your view from those who are affected. Um, so th there's this whole idea, and I, forgive me if this is cliche to you, but it's very, very important to women around the world, which is nothing about us without us. Nothing about us without us. And the reason that is so important is that unless you're hearing from us, whoever the us is. And if you're talking about us without the experts in the room, which is us, meaning the women on the ground, you know, just think, you're, you're walking around with less than half the knowledge because you're gonna be making some decisions that are going to probably do a lot of damage. And we often say, well, we hope we do more good than, than damage, but it, we can do much better much better if the people affected are there with us. You know Monday, this coming Monday, is um, the negotiations with the Taliban. Some of us have been working really hard to get women into this, those negotiations because there were none in the, the negotiations in Moscow. And so there are about between 30 and 40 women leaders who will be there in Doha. That's what I'm talking about. And so follow that in the news. And you know, it probably won't make the front page or the second page, so you're gonna have to go online. But keep going online whenever there are negotiations. And just put in the word women. Find out what the women are doing. And by the way, when people talk about, well, it's hard to find qualified women, how much am I able to say uh, expletives here? <laughs> I'm, I'm not, yes, no, 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 okay. Fill in your own, okay? <laughs> when, you, when people say, uh, we can't find qualified women. It's a, that's a non-issue. That is a non-issue. First of all, in a whole population, how many qualified women are there? A lot. Uh, quite apart from how many, what the literacy rate 
is there are a lot of qualified women how many do you need you need you know what you need about four hundred qualified women to make a big difference in the policies so don't go with that one now what i'd like to do is take you to the balkans and you all know this stuff but just to remind us um, that's where yugoslavia when i was there in 93 yugoslavia had fallen apart and you have these five republics and then you have the region of kosovo the president of the country is a tyrant slobodan milosevic and he chooses the the republic that is the most integrated interestingly enough to go in and make his play. And here's how he did this. And I, I've made more than 20 trips there and, and, and written two books about it, so I know something. Okay, so he, he does it by promoting fear. And I have read the propaganda. And it's all about how people with power are gonna lose their power if these foreigners are in there taking the jobs. And the foreigners he's talking about, that's the Muslim population that has been there since the Ottoman Empire, right? But it's, it's portrayed as who are they? Now, you all, I don't, you know, forgive me, but the way this works, and you'll find this across the board, I work in very, very bad places, I mean, hard places, and this is the playbook. You take the independent um, media, and you call it fake news. And women whom I've worked with have used the, they've said, this is the literal quote, the propaganda comes to you in such small pieces that you can't distinguish what's a lie and what isn't. And this is a direct quote, so I can say it. You need out, outsiders to come in and say, this is bullshit, right? Because you can't tell when you're in the middle of the situation. Even though you're really smart, even though you're, you're, you know the way the world works. So he now has undermined the media. And I could tell you so many stories about this, but I'm not going to. And he says, you know, these other people, these, these Muslims, they're not true Yugoslavs. And, and then he calls for a greater Serbia. So he's a Serb. He wants to take over. And the Serbs are only about a third of the country. He wants greater Serbia. If you want to be cute, you can say, make Serbia great again. All right? And, but I would never say that. And, and it's very, very dangerous because, because he's using a hate. He's targeting a certain population. And it's not unlike what Hitler did to target the cockroaches, right? The Jewish population. Because if you can target, you have a real possibility for for taking power. So, uh, so my husband, the reason I know so much about this, by the way, my husband, that you talked about earlier, some of you may know his name, Charles Ansbacher, but he was so involved here with the, the symphony and all. And, um, and when we were in Vienna, he started getting really involved with, uh, with Bosnia. And he became the principal guest conductor and went 25 times to conduct there. So those of you who, who knew him, um, he, that was true to form. And I went with him, and that's how I came to know the area so well. So um, the second I want to add is now to lead with the unlikely partners, lead in tandem with them. Um, and I'm going to take you now into Afghanistan and sh introduce you, nope, don't want to do that, um, introduce you to a woman named Waj Mafro. You all, these I was going to tell you about a minute ago, so I'm going to rescue myself, okay? I went in to Bosnia and I had my camera. That's what I wanted to tell you about when I was talking about Charles. Do you know what that wall is? It looks like graffiti. It's not. That's where young people came and put their names because they said, 
I want my name on a gravestone. I don't want to just disappear. So they made their own gravestone there on that wall. That's what it was like when I was there. By the way, there's the VIP lounge at the airport. So I thought you'd appreciate that. And this is the scene that was everywhere. And I, I take that scene, which is really important to me. I took all these pictures. And it, I take it with me directly into Kabul. And the person I want to talk to you about, just a second. I want to introduce you to um, Viosa de Bruna and see what it's like that her fingers were on the pulse of what was going on. Uh, she's a very good friend of mine now. She's a physician. She was locked out of her office uh, because she was a Muslim. And she went to the, the hospital and um, there was a big lock on the door. She was very well known, worked with kids. And, um, and so uh, they said, you know, you don't have a job here anymore. She started practicing in her car and just took her, her bag, her physician's bag. And they, the friends and she set up something called she -mail. And so when there was a massacre uh, against the Albanians who were, uh, who were Muslim, uh, people would send these emails around and she would get the emails, she'd jump in her car, she'd go up into the hills where the massacre had uh, occurred, she would take bullets out of people's guts, she would uh, sew up the, uh, where women have been um, mass raped, etc. And uh, then she said, wait a minute, I, I need to take not just my bag, I need to take my camera. And she started taking uh, pictures and then testimony, etc. She built up a case uh, against Milosevic that was spectacular. And sure enough, right before NATO came in with the bombing, they surrounded her home, the security forces. She jumped out a second uh, floor window. She was on the run. She was really hot. People didn't know, you know what to do in terms of whether to keep her or not. Then the exodus. The, the West Clark now is in charge of NATO, and the exodus starts. And as you know, the people moved en masse, and Viosa de Bruna was among them. She set up a, essentially a clinic for the women who, again, were being raped. And then as soon as the bombing stopped, they all went back in. She was named a minister then for independent media. OK, we're going to go back to the fake news. It's so important to have independent media. And and then she was working on quotas, by the way. Remember the allergic piece? The, working on getting quotas, including in, not just the assembly, but also the police force. One of the women who was in the police force became chief of police and then was elected president. And so gives you a sense of the power of the quota. Now, I'd like you to meet her and listen very carefully to what she says about how she worked. It's going to be about two and a half minutes. But I'm going to ask you what you heard, what really popped out to you. Every time I, I play this, and I've been doing it for years, I hear something new. Take a second. She and I climbed Kilimanjaro a couple of years ago. I get bragging rights. We developed this, this forum, regular forum, where we are going there and listen to people. Since I speak these languages, local languages, so I really listen to them. And I, I didn't hate, I didn't send my advisors or somebody else to do it. I, I went myself and international cohort, both of us were together there and we just provided that space. So everybody from three different communities, not only their political leadership, political party leadership, but other people we announced that and they could come. And remember, this was a time when people were getting killed, either from Albanian radicals, national, they didn't want communication, they were thinking just the best way to get rid of the ethnic conflict is to get rid of one ethnicity. 
or by by Serbian uh, uh, spies and agents from Milosevic that were just rampaging around and you know and their secret service working around so it was a dangerous time so we went and we developed this forum and weekly we were talking to them weekly really and listening to their fears listening to their vision maybe I had more open doors because I, I had I really had a, a hand and pulse of people maybe it helped me because I'm a physician so you know and I always practiced even at the time when that opportunity was denied to me I did practice so I listened to people and I knew what's going on and then if I see that there is a problem there that I really can address and I can help solve. So I was there. And so people start recognizing that. And yeah, because I was a woman, I was more interested to find out what's going on and I had that opportunity. Now, let me take the opportunity myself to say I am not into all women this and all women that. That's such, such a mess. You know, you find really, really bellicose women and you know, compare them to Nelson Mandela, okay? So, but there are these bell, bell curves in terms of how women overall are, act, how, how they see things. Like for example, she says, because I was a woman, I really listened. And actually that is borne out by social sciences. That the, the, the top of the bell curve for men is different from the top of the bell curve for, for females. So, you know, don't get excited about that. I mean, I'm not making it up. Um, and obviously the people in this room, you wouldn't be in this room if you weren't enlightened guys, okay? So we're not talking about you anyway. All right, so tell me what you heard, just uh, two or three of you. Raise your hand, tell me anything that popped out for you in terms of what you just heard Dr. Br uh, De Bruyne say. Yes. How much she listened, and uh, that was the key to her success in connecting with the people and then representing them. That's right. And in the same way that she was listening to them, we can listen to her. So that expertise follows. Someone else. I'm capable of doing cold calls. That would really embarrass you. Yes, sir. She listened to their visions and their fears. Isn't that the truth? I have never heard that. I've watched this 30 times, and I've never, never noticed that. But yes, she asked me to come down and work with the women who had run, first of all, to, to get them to run for the assembly, there was all this business, oh, well, culturally, they won't. Of course they did. And, and then, then help, well, what, what is your vision? Obviously, they were conquering their fears to even run, but then what is your vision? And then they got together and worked. One of them was, we need to protect this small minority. I mean, get this. She wanted to protect this small minority. Who were they? They were the Serbs. They were the people who were responsible for the death and destruction of her part of the population. And she said, we have got to protect their rights. Yes. Well, thank you for uh, advocating for women everywhere in the world. Um, my wife, uh, I've been married to the same woman for 41 years. I'm a much better man because I've been married to Debbie, but she uh, calls me a reforming Neanderthal. And that means that I, I'm getting better, but I'm not there yet. I, th I thought that was a compliment, but she, when she teaches me about women, she says, use the three E's, echo, empathize, and eye contact. I don't want to hear what you're saying, Mark. I want you to listen to me. And I think this lady, friend of yours, is a lot like my wife that way. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Yes, well, thank her. Thank her for bringing that in into this room, but you're exactly right. It's much easier for whatever reason, it's easier for women to establish that eye contact.
and that's where you, the person on the other side experiences feeling empathized with. Yes. Hi. I heard her say she went herself, which is oh, yes. very important yes. to, if you're listening and if you want to understand, you've got to be there. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. Thank you. I have to move on, but yes, yes, it isn't about sending your emissaries out and they're gonna do a report. That has to happen too. It's really different because when you're there, you are moved. It's not about information, it's about what happens. There's all kinds of information, right? This is the gut information. Okay, then I am going to now take you to the second one about leaving in tandem. Right, and that's where I'll take you now to, um, to Kabul, which unfortunately looks like a lot like um, Bosnia. And I was there, these are from 1998, so this is while the Taliban was in power. Uh, and this is Wajma, Wajma Pro. Uh, she was raised with 35 uh, cousins, all in the same house. And she wanted to eat meat, only the boys could eat meat. And so she would pill for some meat, and she always got beaten up for it. And, um, and her mother was very oppressive, she said. I just talked to Wajma yesterday, and she said because she was worried that other people would think she was a bad mother because of Wajma being so independent. And I want to be really clear to you, that's not, that's not uh, simply, oh, I want to be a good mother. You could be killed for that if there were accusations that you are raising your girls to read, for example, or to, to get a job, et cetera, you could be killed for that in addition to, to your daughter. And so this is what, these are street scenes. This is what it was like, and I was just, I was so taken, with, and I put on a burqa, and it was so taken, and how you live your daily life holding your child by the hand with that, with that sheath over you. I don't know how you ride a bike, but somehow, and holding that child. Um, and then when we went to the clinic, these were in the waiting room. Oh, it, obviously it's not a room, but, but these women were waiting to see the doctor, and that's what it looks like as she's talking to the doctor. This is hard. This is, this is really hard. So Wajma ends up living in a refugee camp right outside of the Afghan border in, in, um, in Pakistan. And, and on the first floor is a female politician. And I'm going to say the word again, that in 94 there were quotas in the local government where they lived. And she was encouraged to run for a place on the, the town council. And, and then she went higher and higher because of those quotas. And she, um, she eventually became very prominent. She was speaking out. Uh, and Majma was so inspired by her. I mean, you just think about the people who've inspired us, the men and women here, the women who've inspired us. You know, but they didn't just come out of, of no place. But they themselves were encouraged all along the way. So um, when I was there, I had the privilege of going into a clandestine school. And the people who were there, they easily, if that had been known, they easily could have been killed. Of course, there would have been the public flogging. But, but they were breaking every rule that the Taliban had in terms of women. And I asked an elderly woman, I said, I don't get it. Why are you here? You know, why are you here at, at this age? And, and she said, uh, uh, there were, first of all, pieces of paper like this with their names on them. And they were sitting in a circle around them. And when I was there, they were identifying their names. It, it was just like you would when you're first starting to read. I said, why are you doing this? And she said, because I want to find out if what the mullah says is in the Quran really is. So, I mean, the, um, the Taliban were right to be worried about this. And, and so, 
um, little by little, as we were helpful, by the way, the situation for girls changed, and they started really being appreciated. One of the most important drivers of that change was Ashraf Ghani. And many of you that know that name, he, Foreign Policy Magazine, asked who are the 100 most important uh, top um, intellectuals in the world, and he was number 50. Uh, another, another publication asked the same, he was number two, uh, was foreign min was um, finance minister in Afghanistan. And that's when I did this video. He and I both spoke at something called the Club of Madrid, which is former presidents and, um, and prime ministers. And I, as he walked out the door, I sort of grabbed him by the lapel and said, does it make any difference if women are involved? And this is what he said. This is before he was president. This is going to take a minute to roll. Going to happen. Women bring very different styles of leadership if they are allowed to develop their own distinctive style than men. And that the model of leadership that, that we have inherited through the masculinity of the state needs to be questioned. This model is not flexible enough, it's not creative enough. Uh, so, management wise, we need a fundamental rethinking, not just in terms of positioning, as you've been arguing, and I agree with you, consciously looking to allow women to rise but also in terms of the change of status, so that they don't then become honorary men. Yeah, interesting. And you think about him then becoming the president of Afghanistan. He spoke, and I was there to the combined uh, chambers of our Congress, spoke for an hour. In that hour, he devoted 20 minutes to women and girls. So that, that changes the world. And by the way, the U.S. forces that have been there in Afghanistan, they have allowed that flourishing for women and girls. Make no bones about it. Well, back to Wajma. Uh, she's developed a really important research center for women, peace, and security. She was working on the ground to get women to run for police. Why? I mean, to join the police forces by the thousands. Why did it matter? She said, well, if you have uh, someone who's run into a house, a bad guy, you know, the, the, uh, the, the forces can't go in, the guys can't, uh, and the police, normal police, but women police can. But she said it's not just that kind of access to go into a house. She said it's covert access. I thought that was so interesting because she was saying things that I had heard all over the world. And that is when the women wash the clothes of their boys, they find things in there. They find little uh, shreds of a leaflet that talks about the leader of the Taliban. You get what I'm saying? It's not just, oh, women are so great. Women have different experience. They know that their son, through, th through this other leaflet, their son is thinking about blowing himself up because that's what that leaflet is about. And so when he comes in so late, because he's been in you know, some kind of big group frenzy hoo-ha, she doesn't tell her husband he's asleep. He doesn't know what's going on. She spends the time with him because she washed his clothes. The last I want to mention to you is bluffing. Bluffing is different from being dishonest. Bluffing, to me, is when you've got to make a difference in the world and, and people don't believe you can and you just have to push past it. And I've had a lot of experiences and they've been really positive and really hard. And that's me talking to the Austrian foreign minister. He, he can't have Austrian uh, troops, as you know, outside of the country because of World War II. And so now he's saying to me, please, please, please get intervention from your country to stop the genocide. And it was. It was a genocide. I mean, there's nothing else to call it. So I hosted negotiations. It was a great honor. In 94, a year before the Dayton 
negotiations. And so I, 14 days uh, in my office, and uh, there were um, maps all over the floor. We were trying to figure out if the country would be divided up and how, et cetera. And the CIA and DOD, they had come to the conclusion that we had to split the country up and the Serbs who were the aggressors, they would get a big chunk of it. And the State Department said, no, no. It's a, bunk of, a bunch of, of drunks who are on the hillsides and there's, the snipers are taking out, today it's gonna to be old people with canes, tomorrow it's gonna to be anyone wearing blue. I mean, it was horrible, it was horrible, but it was not because the Serbs were so uh, powerful. And so you had this, I was watching all of this, you know, inside, inside politics, if you will, going on. And uh, so anyway, we got, uh, got an um, agreement, 14 days, I, they were in my office, they were in my home, et cetera. We go, it's, it's, a, it's a room like you, and I know I'm short on time, and I will be really good. Oh, well, I won't complain, I'm gonna bluff a little. Okay, <laughs> all right. And so, uh, <laughs> great escort, Whitney. So, um, so uh, look, we go to the signing of the agreement, President Itzabegovic, President Tujman, and President Clinton, and, and I look around the room, and y'all, it's all gray suits. Now, okay, you know that I'm an ardent feminist. You know I helped start the Women's Foundation of Colorado. You know all that stuff. I hosted these negotiations 14 days and nights and never saw that it was all men. I never saw it. And I have to say, I am not a Neanderthal on this. Please tell Debbie. I, I, I get it, and if I can't see it, because I'm looking through the lens of security instead of gender, I better, I better be careful about how much I'm blaming other people. And yet, it's really, really important. So finding, you know, who, was, who was responsible for making sure that there were women in the negotiations? General Jawa, he said he wasn't, and I don't, I don't disbelieve him. Well. Well, who was? You know what? I could have bluffed. Like, why not? The worst that would have happened is they would have said, you don't have the authority to do this. But why didn't I? I could have said, I'm hosting these, and we will have minimum one-third women in these negotiations. It just didn't dawn on me to do that. I consider that one of the failure stories in my life. I have a lot of failure stories. I used to wonder, who were these these people behind these big desks, when Hitler was rolling over the swath of Europe, what were these people doing? And then there was the liberation of the um, Mauthausen, where 100,000, you know, 90,000 people out of 190,000 died horrible deaths. And these wonderful Americans in their, with their tanks came rolling over the, the hills and did not know that that camp was there and discovered it. And in the death row it's, um, were, was my, my great mentor, Viktor Frankl, and Simon Wiesenthal were there, was there, these great, great leaders today in, um, in that world of, of the Jewish voices. And I got to be in this place where we, all the countries were lined up and we were all going to put a wreath in the, the center of the camp. And so I have a color guard in front of me, and they're holding the wreath that I will then take. And I, as I go to the back, I say something to the, to the German ambassador. She has sunglasses on because she can't stop crying, you know, just that sense of responsibility. I say something to the Israeli ambassador. I go to the back because her eye has been shot in is United States. And as I walk along, people are yelling, you know, grazie, grazie, shalom, and, and danke, danke, to me, because I am the United States of America. You know, it, what an experience. What an experience. And I sit down, and it's never again, never again, never again. And you know what? Back on that big mahogany desk is a pile of cables this high saying it's happening again, and I'm not doing anything about it. I'm behind my big desk, and what is happening is the strangulation of 
what we called the safe areas. That's what the UN called them. And they were, um, they were surrounded by the Serb forces. You know, this picture from Mauthausen, that could have been Srebrenica. That could have been Garajda. And there was this kind of terrible juxtaposition, trying to keep life alive, and yet, and yet this, this desperateness, that look at their faces, the wine, the, um, all the, that they've gone through in terms of deprivation. And then it happens, and then it happens, and Srebrenica falls. And when I say fall, the women were separated from the men and the boys. And the women and children were told, get on the buses, we'll take you to a safe place, and the men and boys will follow on foot. And of course, they never arrived. And 8,000 unarmed, unarmed boys and men uh, are executed. And what this is, the greatest failure of my life, the greatest. I was writing cables to President Clinton and learned later from the National Security Advisor that he, when he would get these cables from me, we'd have to intervene, he would put his initials on, they would be circulated throughout the National Security Council. I had no idea of that. I had no idea. And what I know is I was weighing very, very carefully how many times I was going to bother him. And you know why? Because he was going to run for re-election, and I really, really wanted to be the ambassador to India. I don't have to lay it out, do you? You can tell I'm flustered. And it is flustering. I put together a year later a, a, a big commemoration. She wrote the name of her son all over that cloth because he was one of the ones killed. This is Kata Hotic, whose son was killed, her only child. And she writes in the book that, that I wrote about what it was like. They used to smoke, you know, sitting on the porch, and, and he, would, he would blow um, smoke rings. And she said, I just I think about that, and I just wipe my tears in my loneliness. And then she says, this is the moment. She said, what about those boys who killed my boy? She said, they must be having nightmares, cutting people's throats. I wonder what it's like. How do they live? They were, they were given medals if they could kill the most people. They, like, they were caught up in this. I wouldn't want what happened to me and my son to ever, ever happen to them. That's what I'm talking about. That's the looking in the eye. That's the empathy that you're talking about. So when I talk about inclusive security, I want to just take us back to this moment when I'm sitting, and this is the last thing I'm saying. I'm sitting in the country team meeting. We had one of those every week. 14 different parts of the US government. And I, we gathered, and I would hear, OK, what's happening with the FBI? What's happening with agriculture? What's happening, blah, blah? And what's happening with INS? And this woman told me, I just came back from Serbia. There's a concentration camp. Yes, the peace accords have uh, been signed, but um, and they're pouring water on top of the Muslim men who are there and then leaving them out in the cold, right? It's just as a kind of torture. And, but, and I said, well, 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 the peace has been signed. Why are they still there? And she said, well, it, you know, we're going to bring them out, but the, it's the Christmas holidays. It's going to take about 10 days. I said, you what? You what? I, I was tired of my failure stories. I really was. And I said, what? They're going to be in a concentration camp for 10 more days so people can worship Jesus, right? Is that really, is that really what we're going to do? So I get on the phone, I call the INS back in Washington. I said, 
get those men out now? And the man said very sheepishly, well, do you, do you have the authority to, to do that? And I said, yes. And that's what I mean by bluffing. Of course he did. Of course he did. You know, and really, that was one of the most meaningful moments in my career. Just that, that one bit and learning, you know, just put it out there. Just, if that's what it takes, put it out there and see what happens. And I cannot tell you how appreciative I am to be in this place with you. And I thank you for letting me run over a little. I'm going to be over there. If anyone, I, I certainly can't be here because of setting up for the next person, but I will be over there if anyone wants to, to talk any further. Uh, I, I'm watching your faces. You are already talking to me. You said volumes, volumes already in the last hour. So thank you so much.